Hi everyone and welcome to a Rewind with Jess Maloney. Jess, I'm so glad that you're going to be with us today talking about your life, how you've got to where you are and I just, one of the first things that I want to say about you is that you can't be confined to one box at all. You're a <laughs> multifaceted human being. We don't need one job title with Jess Maloney because she can literally do so many things so thank you for joining us um we'll just go through basically we're basically going to rewind your life and <laughs> go back to the beginning kind of just go through how you've got to where you are today and your journey in PR and in management and also then iStudios which you want to talk about obviously um so yeah thank you for joining us how are you I'm good, thanks for having me. Good, that's okay. Where are you right now? It looks like you're somewhere. Oh, so I'm actually in Antigua right now. Um, I, one of my clients, well, Renelle, um, she is shooting a secret project here. So I am here to, you know, manage the project. And yeah, love it. I'm in London, so it's nice. <laughs> love it. I'm happy for you that you are in London. <laughs> um, so let's basically, I feel like we should just start and go right back to the beginning. Young Jess, who was she? Young Jess was very different if you'd have met me then. Um, so young, young Jess, I wanted to, so I danced um, from when I was very small. So I did ballet and contemporary. And I never wanted to be a professional dancer, but I wanted to be a dance teacher. So that's what yeah. I always thought I would do. Um, I went to a performing arts college um, because I did acting as well. I could never sing though, FYI. So I was like, that was never, <laughs> never a thing. And if you ever hear me sing, I know I'm not good. Um, no so sense. yeah, so I always wanted to, to go into, into dance teaching. Um, and it was kind of always it, that like there was never anything else. I kind of considered the police for a minute and then was like, no. Um, so yeah, it was that's always- yeah, that was, and actually, I applied to be a PCSO when I was like 18, didn't get in, yeah. um, and I think that's for the best, but yeah, so the police kind of always was part of something that I'd wanted to, or thought I wanted to do, um, but yeah, so I suppose I, yeah, did dancing, all of my kind of academic was, you know, like I, I did, I was academic, but it was mainly like creative, it was dance and drama, and I did textiles and, and things like that. Um, mm. And it really was only when I was filling out my UCAS form that kind of out of nowhere, I was like, maybe I want to get into fashion. But it was like, I had really? never done, yeah, like I'd done textiles, um, but that was it. And to this day, I don't know what it was. There was like not a like defining point in my life that made me think, it was just as if I, I literally was just like, maybe I can give it a go. And it was, honestly one of the hardest decisions at that time that I'd ever made because yeah I felt that whatever I went to university to go and study was what I would then go and do in my career of course yeah. like we all know that that's not how it goes but like at that time that's how I felt um so I spent a lot of time I spoke to like my dance teachers and it was actually one particular dance teacher that was like why don't you go and do fashion at university? And if you decide that isn't the right career for you, like dance will always be there. Like, you know, you've danced your whole life, like it, up to that point. Um, yeah. so she was You're always going to be able to. Yeah. So that was kind of that. And, and honestly, she, that, that was it. I was like, right, I'm going to fill out my UCAS. I'm going to put fashion universities down, but never design. It was always the business side that I wanted. Right. Okay. Um, and then that was kind of that and then I filled out like the dream was obviously London College of Fashion like anyone that studies or wants yeah to study it's the first one and like just the biggest one that comes to mind yeah and I think I was a little um I suppose I would say I was a little naive at the time like when I went to university everyone of course wanted to go to London College of Fashion but I had kind of only really discovered it so to speak when I decided that maybe that's what I wanted to do yeah. so I put that on my UCAS and I put um, like Ma uh, what did I, Manchester, um, there was a, like however many others I had to put down. I never thought I'd get into LCF. And then I remember they only allowed like 50 people onto my course, which obviously really isn't that much when you consider how no. many. Thousands um, of people apply every year. Thousands. Yeah. 
So the course was um, the course was fashion management, um, and my specialism was in marketing. So anyway, I'll never forget the day that I went for this. Like you had to go and have exams, and I had to have a maths test and an English test, and I had to have a group interview. I had to have a solo interview. I had to like do a presentation. It's a lot for something you've just decided that you want to do. <laughs> yeah, and also especially maths. Like I was kind of shit at maths, so I was like, I want to do this. Anyway, like miracle of miracles, I was like, shit, like I got in, like I got into LCF and that was the point where I was like, this is it, like, this is what I'm going to do. So you went, so you left Bedford, you went to London, you were at London College of Fashion. What did you think of, I mean, we don't need to touch on this on, on a lot of detail, but what did you think of kind of the degree and the options it gave to you? How do you feel about uni as a whole? Truthfully, like um, my course, I there was a lot of if you knew such and such in the industry uh you know we were meant to be like the elite at, at lcf and yeah. you know you kind of were expected to at least know people in the industry or you've got there somehow like i don't know maybe your family's got ties to something that was not the case like i didn't know anyone in fashion my course was um so it was basically four years so i did an, um, a diploma in international studies so i went away for a year and I think this was the define, or this was like, again, a big point at that time in my life where I only wanted to go and work for Levi's in Brussels because their European head office is there. So yeah. I was like, that's it. I don't want to apply for anything else. And my uni were like, you basically aren't going to get it. They said that outright to me. They were like, you will not get this internship. Like you don't have, I mean, I'd had experience. I've done internships fifth prior um but they yeah. were like you know you kind of don't have enough to warrant you getting this you must apply for more and I was like I'm not doing it like I will get this and I will show you and I got it I got this internship yes. the university were like oh, fuck. um so <laughs> off I went to Brussels um very interesting place to live but I'm very glad that I did it and I I learned a lot from doing that internship. And it was the first role that I had. So I, because I didn't know anyone in fashion, um, basically every holiday, like whether it was Christmas or Easter or summer, I internship, I interned, sorry. So yeah. I, and at that point, I didn't really know, like, yes, I was specializing in marketing, but like, was that it? Like, I didn't know whether I wanted to kind of go magazine side, whether at one point I was like, maybe styling's what I want to do. So I made sure that I got internships at, every play I went to magazines I did stylists like I did all of this experience so I could see where I wanted to be yeah and I think that's magazine, so important yeah and like I realized after doing an internship with a magazine it personally I, I was like I can't see myself doing this stylist props to you because I was like this is not for me <laughs> I, I I interned with a really amazing stylist and I'm be forever grateful for for working with him and I learned a lot but it yeah that's that's something that I, I definitely wasn't wasn't cut for so when I got the Levi's position and it was solely marketing I was like this is it like that was when I was yeah. like okay fine like I'm meant to be here this is great um so I did that and then I was like right I need another internship and this was, I suppose, a bit that really changed the path of my life, honestly. Um, I got an internship at Vivian Westwood. Again, Amazing. the university had never, ever managed to get an internship. And that was me. I just emailed them. I was like, I'm going to just email. I really wanted to work. Yeah, I'm going to just send this email. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let's go. So, um, so yeah, so I basically got an internship with Vivian Westwood. And it, that was honestly, I it's the best thing like that had happened. Like it was just incredible. Like to get that internship yeah. to work there. Um, yeah, it was, it was really, really, truly incredible. Amazing. From Vivian Westwood, how did your journey, you started kind of in PR, right? You started in fashion yeah, so PR? From, how did that yeah. kind of develop? So it was marketing and PR. So yes, yeah, so I suppose Levi's I did the marketing and, and Vivian Westwood was in the PR office, that internship. Um, so left Vivian Westwood, um, finished my, my degree at university. And I then, I got my job before I graduated. So I applied. Nice around, it was the beginning of the year that I was graduating. And I thought if I wait and I start looking for jobs when everyone's graduated, you're in a pool of like all of these people. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna try and find a job. So I did, I basically got a job. My first job was working at LS the sports yeah. brand and I was there for two years so it was really like you know it was I graduated 
handed my dissertation in on the Friday and I started my new job on the Monday at 9 a.m. That's crazy. <laughs> but so you, it sounds. And then I got, whilst I was at LS, I had a phone call from Vivian Westwood team, the PR team, where they had a PR position coming, you know, becoming open. And did I want to interview for it? So, of course, I went for the interview. And, and I got it. So, again, that was from the fact that I'd interned, that they'd remembered. And I'd stayed friends with the my bosses at the, when who were my bosses at, you know when I was yeah there. um so yeah this job came up they put me forward and I got it so off I went back to Vivian Westwood but as a, like a paid em employer and it yeah that I bet you were so happy walking back in that day because you know that you've already done the work you're familiar with maybe if the team was similar then you're yeah. familiar with the team and kind of how they function but you've kind of like earned your slot so yeah. I bet it felt really good walking Oh my god, it was that day. Oh my god, uh, like truly it was I owe everything to like that job that I had at Vivian Westwood. So how do you go from there at Vivian Westwood to working by yourself yeah. or for yourself in management and as a director? So I um I knew I didn't want to live in the UK. It was like always America, America. So when I was at Vivian Westwood, they had um, offices just in LA at that time. New York hadn't opened. And right. so I'd been there for a number of years at that point. And potentially there was like the opportunity for me to go to LA. And devastatingly at the time, it never worked out. And that was kind of the kick that I had where I was like, right, I, I, there was nothing wrong at Vivian Westwood. Like I loved the job. I loved yeah. the people. I loved the work I was doing, but I was like, I can't move anywhere. And like I say, I was still, still, I was quite young. And I was like, I'm, I'm someone that's constantly hungry. Like I'm looking for the next thing. So yeah. I then was like, fuck, like, where do I go? Laura, who, you know, my boss, like I just said, Laura, wasn't, you know, wasn't going anywhere. Um, so I was like, I can't really grow here. Um, so I decided that, okay, I need to look for something else. And then my next step, because at that time I'd started working with talent, like with celebrities, yeah. uh, and dressing them. And of course, working at somewhere like Vivian Westwood opened a lot of, a lot of those doors and I, I made incredible contacts. Um, so I was like, okay, like maybe getting into like PRing celebrities could be a thing. So I basically left there, moved on to another role. And that was, like I say, essentially PRing celebs and working in that role. And that naturally then stepped into looking at management. So who was like the first person that you were in contact with that kind of attracted you to being a manager or just being in management in general? Was there like a certain person that did that for you? Um, so I met Machine Gun Kelly when I was at Vivian Westwood. So I, it's like totally rogue how it all happened. My yeah. brother basically was like, you need to listen to this artist. And now we're going back like maybe eight years, nine years. And I was like, oh my God, this guy's sick. And like, he looked great. And I was like, I've got to dress him. So obviously, like I say, it's when I was at Vivian Westwood. So I found this random email that honestly, I couldn't even tell you who it was at the time. I found this email and I was just like, hey, like I work at Westwood. I really like, you know, Machine Gun Kelly's music. Um, let me know if you're ever in London or if I can dress, you know, dress him for anything. And that was really it. He then came to London. I met him and his team. And it kind of like kickstarted that relationship. And we just kind of stayed we became friends like I dressed him for things but like at, when I left Vivian Westwood we kind of stayed in contact and then his management team were like hey like we want to get him into the fashion scene more and right. I kept saying you know I mean he's you know he's looks incredible like I felt that it was like a natural thing so I'd said yeah. it a few times um and then his team like hey like let's do it so I then started working with him in like a professional capacity that was honestly the point where I was like this is what I, I really want to start with kind of working more directly with teams and with people um and Kel's kind of came with me for 
you know, a few other companies that I went to. And then when I started on my own, um, Kels was, was there. Him and his team have always been like incredibly supportive. I made, you know, a lot of contacts. Like I say, I mean, it's like the job that kind of was the one for me. Um, yeah, set you up. I made, yeah, and I, I did. I made a lot of US contacts from, from working at Westwood. So that carried you through when you got there. Yeah, and then I just my job's everything I mean it's not really a job it's like my life like I love it and like I say like I, I do I'm, I'm a hustler and when I really believe in something and, and someone like I will honestly like I will move heaven and earth to make sure that that person gets what they want and what they deserve um, because ultimately I think that is what makes a good manager um, is somebody that but if you don't believe in the person that you're working with it will never work and yeah. That really, I suppose, falls into the reason that I started on my own was because I couldn't, you know, when I was working for people, so then I suppose, because I, I then went to a company that just did management. Right. And of course, at that point, like you don't get a choice of the talent because you've walked into a company and they've got their talent. So yeah. when I joined that company, I bought Kells with me. Um, I was working with another female musician at the time. So she came with me. Um, so I kind of walked in, you know, with some very good clients um, and they had their clients. And I just couldn't get to grips with like repping someone that I didn't believe. So like there are a few people on the board that it was kind of hard for me to, to really understand like mm. what they wanted to do and what their vision was and, and what, you know, they, they wanted from their career. And that was when I was like, I can't, I can't necessarily work for a company because it, I don't believe in this person. And yeah, if everyone fucking knows if people can tell like and I'm very black and white so I, I also can't lie so it was like, <laughs> kind of hard to be like okay I've got to rep someone but like do I really believe them like you know I can try but it's it doesn't come naturally and I'm someone that like I like my shit to flow naturally and it's, yeah well so it seems like you put a lot of uh, passion and or energy into work on your your passion is and where your belief is so yeah if you're not feeling that hundred percent and you're having to force it, yeah, then that is like an, an unnatural thing for you to be doing because so yeah. far it has worked for you to be kind of using yeah. that using your energy the way you had. So yeah, I understand, I understand what you mean by that. Um, so how does that then go to you working solo? So it was interesting. I, I suppose I should say, I, I always, Working at companies, so obviously early on realized Corp was not for me. Um, loved reviewing Westwood. Then the other companies, you know, that I went to after, um, I, I kind of was just like, I think I'm better being my own boss. Like I'm such a perfectionist. And mm. if I always felt like on when I worked with teams, like if someone didn't match that, uh, it would piss me off and it's not the person's fault of course not like we all are driven by different yeah. things and but I couldn't understand and I and I find it difficult to that if you're in a job and you don't really like it that you may be negative attitude or you know the fact that you might not push 100% will always impact the overall team so if you've got someone that's like a perfectionist that is given 110% and someone on the team isn't kind of isn't really a fair flow you know like it doesn't yeah and that person that's a perfectionist will always end up with more work because they're like hang on a minute like let me just check this stuff so I when was you're in a company environment that's difficult to then balance because you never want to be either like comparing your paychecks or comparing the role the role title that you have or the responsibility that you have when you actually feel like you're carrying it or putting more of yourself into something yeah. than yeah. someone else is and I think when you, so like, you know, the, I suppose the company, the companies that I was at where you, it was like management, it was like management, but it was also agenting. So you were still making these clients their money. And, yeah. you know, look, I suppose money makes the world go round. It's personally not my, um, it's not my main driving force for my job is not money. Um, but of course, if you're making a lot of money for someone else and you're not, you're seeing the money you're making and you ain't cutting that, you know, there's kind of, 
when you're an agent or you're a manager and you do those roles, you realize quickly that really the person is buying into you. Like, you know, same with talent. Talent is buying into me. The talent isn't buying into the agency I'm at or the company I'm at. They, mm. they connect with me and they like the way that I work. So the same way that, you know, if you're making all this money for someone, you're getting those jobs because the client likes you or, you know, like you're managing to negotiate a good deal. Mm -hmm. I can negotiate that deal on my own so I was like okay um and Ronell was it Ronell was the reason that I left Ronell was the reason I started on my own was Ronell the reason for Jess Maloney management yeah she was so the last company I was at so like I say, I, I met Ronell through um, the, mu- the female musician that I had at the time yeah. um, that I'd taken to this company. And I, so Ronell had come to London and I met her and I was like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. But obviously I was like trying to be cool because I was like, everyone yeah. wants to <laughs> Like everyone wants her. And I was like, how am I going to like finesse this? Um, so I... I basically like kind of asked her, I was like, have you got representation? Because I didn't understand how, because Renella graduated by that point and she, you know, she'd shop things. People knew who she was, of course. So yeah. I couldn't understand that this girl was doing everything on her own. So I was like, have you got reps? So she was like, oh, I, and you know, she'd been to agencies a lot at that point and she'd met a lot of people. Um, and she was like, I haven't really found anyone. So I basically went to my boss at the time and I was like, hey, like we've got to rep this girl. Like she's fucking fire. Like now I have never worked with a photographer. At this point I've worked with talent, so, like celebrity sort of talent. So I yeah. was like, I never worked with a photographer, but I was like, I'll figure it out. Like, I feel like if you can, if you can manage, if you're an agent or a manager, you can kind of sell anything, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Well, maybe you should be able to, if you're really good, you maybe yeah. you should be able to. Yeah, but I could see that, like, I honestly, the same way that I felt about Kells, like the way where I was like, I like, this guy's incredible. Like he's, he's going to be, he's going to be huge. Like he'll be everything. I felt that way about Renell and I felt so strongly. And so I asked my boss at the time and she was like, you ain't never going to make money from this girl. Like, no, basically. So I was like, look, like, you know, this is it. Like, I want to rep this girl. Like she's going to be huge. And I want to be the, I want to be the person that's doing that. Yeah. Um, and she didn't want to. It's being able to see that though. You obviously were able to see that. And, yeah. and, actually act on it yeah and also she's she you know surely she's in america she's based in america so the fact you'll go into the effort to yes. say no we need to wrap her that's huge yeah. so i um so yeah so i was basically like i'm out i was like i'm a, i'm i'm going i was and honestly like I, you know when people say like oh my god like what what made you work on your own like did you prep truly no like had Renell not have walked, had I never met her I honestly don't know I think I would have worked for myself but would it be in the field the creative field that I'm in now I don't know like I just felt so strongly about her um and I left and started on my own that's amazing because that's a proper like human connection that also then ties in your work yeah. So yeah. at that point, and honestly, I was like, if it doesn't work, because at that point, me and Ronell were not like, um, it wasn't like she'd fully sort of like come over to me. We basically started really like organically where I said, hey, like, why don't I just help you with your emails at least? So we started it where like I would go to her. Oh, she really had no one. No, she had no one. So oh. um, I, we said, and I'll always remember it, because at this point, I then, I then left England, went to L.A. So I was in LA and that's when, so Renella and I kind of started this very organic relationship and I was checking her emails. I was advising her on stuff. Um, and it was meant to be kind of like a stop gap until she found someone that she wanted to, to rep her and manage her. Um, and it's always been me. <laughs> and so now you're an auntie like, girl with Renella. <laughs> it, was, it was just really, um, it was really great and from the beginning like my passion of, of what I saw in Renal then and what I see now has never changed it's only ever got bigger and I yeah that was honestly how how I started on my own. More of your clients now are based in New York right? <clears throat> yes. So how so do you kind of how do you how do you how does the process of you taking on a new client happen? 
for anyone that might be interested in someone taking on in, on um so how okay so when i i like to work with someone um I suppose let's take a, a photographer because I also work with with like the most incredible makeup artists as well. Um, like when I think for photography particularly, like I like to work or I see something in them before there's a point where you know that they're going to like hit it like and it's going to like blow this, you know, like their work's going to fucking go everywhere. Yeah. And any, any, I think any good agent, any good manager of anyone, it doesn't necessarily need to be a creative, um, can see the point that they're gonna, that that person's gonna get to. And I wanna get, I like to get someone before they hit that point. Because you can see, like, you can see how their work is, you can kind of see their eye. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really not necessarily about who they've shot with or for. It's really like, you can just tell when you look at their work um, that maybe like a little, you know, guidance and some you know kind of steering of what they should do um will help them get to that point where they're then getting like the big deals and you know shooting. well yeah because like even going back to what you were saying about um London College of Fashion like some of this will always be how it is some of the most talented people will need at some point a contact or someone to fall kind of into their life or just something to happen which does push them in the direction that then makes them just like skyrocket. And then yeah. some people that, you know, they don't have as much drive, but they do have contacts or they are born into that environment. Like those things might happen for them early on, but whether that can be sustained is kind of a different story. Yeah, and you know what, like, you know, those people that have, that are fortunate, that have family in places, or, you know, maybe they have the financial ability to get to places quicker than, than the normal person that's great and and you know that's that's their life and that's amazing mm. however you will never someone that's a fucking hustler that has got there off their own merit that person will always continue that way because you know no other way like you know you don't have the financial stability to you know if this shit falls to the ground well i've still got bills to pay and i still got you know you've got other shit you've got to pay for so i think that you when you've made it off your own there's like a different sense of achievement and I think that you see things in a totally different way. How do you then get to, well tell me about basically iStudios. iStudios is born, is, is Ronell and I's company. So through um, through the years of working with Ronell, because at one point, so um, at one point I then started working there was obviously Renau. I started freelancing for an agency in London um, doing celebrity stuff. So I still have kind of my foot in the door with the celeb stuff. And it was like casting yeah. that I was doing. Um, and I was consulting for a musician um, on like, rebranding him. And they were really like my solid clients for like a, you know, kind of a couple years. And it was then when I started being like, okay, like I... Ronell had really, like I said, she was shooting a lot of amazing things and, and her name was really kind of growing. Um, and I realized that I loved working with photographers. And, you know, I respect Ronell so much where I would never ever at that point, and I, you know, of course, we're working together now, so it's, or in business together, so it's different. I would never have taken on a client that was like in a creative field outside of what I was doing at the time without consulting Ronell. I wanted to ensure that Renelle felt comfortable because, you know, I'm, I'm her manager. I, I'm there constantly. You can call me anytime and I'll pick my cell phone up. So I was asking Renelle and it was kind of becoming apparent where it was like, we could do this together. And Renelle had always kind of spoken about how she wanted to build, you know, from when I first started with her, she'd always wanted to build iStudios as, as like a creative family, so to speak. Yeah. So we kind of just decided that it worked best if we joined together and really kind of like launched our studios as as a creative family we don't like agents we say creative family um and that's really how our studios was born what do you see now for our studios going forward so we um we also so we signed um an incredible makeup artist as well marcelo that we work with um and we really want to i studios is like i say it's a family i studios is not we have no intention of it becoming like a huge agency like we don't 
like to use the word agency. Um, yeah. And we just really want it to continue being a family, um, to work with other creatives, but it just really remains small and it, but it grow in like, when I say grow, I mean like our clients grow and they get, you know, their paths like flourish, like we all want everyone's to. Okay, so tell me about how you feel about being a woman in the industry that you're in. I, um, I honestly don't really, um, being an, like a female doing my job, I don't feel really like kind of any type of way about that. I think you can be successful at my job, whether you're a male or a female. I think I generally, I think as a female, perhaps in the industry or over my career, I think I'm very like, I've been around male, you know, like my father and, and my brother who, I'm super, super close with, you know, I was kind of brought up by men, so to speak. So like, I'm used to male energy and like, I get on, I get on very well with guys. I am not afraid. Like if I'm in a room of guys, like I'll chat, like there's nothing, like I don't feel like cautious or like I'm not worthy. Like I don't feel any of that. Yeah. Do I think that men look at women sometimes in a, in a way that is, is not as good as them? Then yeah, I think sometimes, and I've definitely experienced it. I remember there was one time where it was a, I was working for myself and it was a, a job that I was freelancing at. And it was, um, uh, I was in like a boardroom with men basically and they didn't like my opinion on something. And I basically, they put, one of the guys put their, his hand in my face and told me that he'd heard enough of my opinions and that if I had one, I can go outside. And I'm telling you, there was no way that happened to like any of the other guys. Like they were saying exactly the same thing. Mm. And it was because I was a woman. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they also knew that my point was very valid. But I think, you know, there unfortunately, I think still is an element where some, but it's only some guys. Like, I don't think, I think we have gotten far you know in certain ways that guys do respect women and we can you know women of course we can be successful business women um do I think there's certain things that are attached to being a woman in business yes I think if you're a successful business woman you probably come up against a lot so you've kind of become a bit hardened and you've got a thick skin and you know you're not you're probably not a wallflower and I don't mean that just because I've got loads of tattoos, like, but like, you're probably <laughs> like, you've got something to say for yourself and you'll say if something's not right. And I think that that is probably been something that I have experienced a lot. Like I'm very direct, I'm very upfront. If something's not working for me, actually in my life, whether it's personal or, or professional, like I'm a tell, I'm a say to you, like I'm gonna like chop it up. I'm gonna tell you why it's not working. How can we move forward? And I think that that in through the years, people have found it rude. You can come across obnoxious. You've got too much to say for yourself. Do I think if a man approaches it, same situations in the same way, they'd be called the same things? That's a fucking lutely not. Like a, a woman that has something to say and is outspoken, we're rude, like we are, we're rude and we're seen a certain way. A guy can do it and no one has a problem. And that's something that like I definitely personally like I think is is unfair and I think that should change more. How do you uh, feel then about man about your clients that are female? Do you feel like they ever experienced that and do you ever have to step in or or have you ever spoken to them about that? Not really. I think um I definitely kind of in a protective in. way, I mean. I think that sometimes people are a bit like, oh wait, like you're you're only whatever age so I think that the age thing definitely I've spoke to the, my clients about um I think maybe with some females it's definitely been more of a like I think the money side I think there definitely is an issue with women who have money or make money um and about the way that they're perceived so lastly I just want to know from you any advice you would give to young people or not young people anyone who kind of wants to take similar steps uh the sim similar steps to what you've taken for young for like anyone that's younger i would say like inter like internships like i literally can't like stress that enough um that it's so important so i definitely say that i think generally to do the role that i do um i think I don't know I feel like you kind of will naturally know if like you're good at this like 
you know whether you can if you can manage yourself well and your and certain you know kind of aspects of your life you will likely be a very good manager um and you just it's honestly a lot of it as well is common sense yes there's other parts um but it is common sense and really you have to be someone that you can put someone else in front of you so like i say you know my my clients will ultimately always come first than before me so like their needs and their wishes will always come before myself um and i think if you're somebody that can do that and you're fine with that then yeah i feel like this this role would be would work for you amazing I well to, i feel like trust trust your God. Your God. I, feel like, I feel like i kind of dipped around at the beginning a bit until i kind of found um what i you know what i'm doing now um but like my gut at every point was like correct um and also I would say definitely keep be a nice person like truly I think that there is too people are too quick to like um forget people like not take time to talk to people um mm -hmm. and I think it's so important to like really nurture relationships and build relationships and just be nice to people like I feel in people aren't like you know people never sets you back People want to get to the top and you know what, like you can't knock people, but when there's like backstabbing and, and that shit, everyone knows who does this is in this industry knows that shit happens. That will, that will catch up with you. Like I personally, like I want, I am very honest in business. I'm an honest businesswoman, Um, and you know, I will always maintain that. Um, and that I think will always serve you more. If you're stabbing people in the back to get to the top, that shit will catch up with you one day. Love it. Great advice. And I feel like that applies universally wherever you are. Yes. Just just be nice. And also work hard because it's and yes, got, I mean, of got course. you. I, is, I mean, just to reflect on what you've told me, you've clearly worked in so incredibly hard your entire working life, I'm sure, also beforehand. And yeah, I'm just so glad to have spoken to you and just uh, got to the me. bottom of how I, you are, where you are. <laughs> sorry if I rambled and if, so, if people have, if someone has listened to the end then thank you because that's a whole ramble that I've done I'm known to ramble um so yeah thanks for listening <laughs> that is okay well I hope you have an amazing time on the rest of this trip and that Renaus project goes well I'm so excited to see what ice studios brings in the future and I hope everyone keeps their eye out because I will be thanks love thanks bye <laughs>